Hey everybody, welcome to chapter 10, module 10 of families in stress. Um, so now we're gonna move away from all these various models of stress management, crisis management, and into something completely different. We're now gonna start talking for the next two modules, this one being very short and the next one being significantly longer. We're gonna talk about um, the various uh, ways of approaching crisis management. So this is essentially what we do with the families in crisis. Now we're gonna start this module by just a, a quick overview of how we got to where we are with crisis management. And then in module 11, we're gonna move really deeply into the woods of formal crisis management. This is where you wanna be as a social worker. This is what you wanna know. All the other stuff has led up to this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that said, let's uh, delve into the material a little bit by moving to the next slide. So let's talk about the timeline of formal crisis management. We're gonna start way back in the 1940s before any of us were born. Lindemann in 1944 noted that paraprofessionals, people who don't have a degree in psychology, degree in social work, paraprofessionals are capable of helping people work through grief. They just need to understand the stages of grief and then how to help people through those stages. It doesn't require a degree to be able to do that. Kaplan in 1948 looked at the Wellesley Project um, or created the Wellesley Project to emphasize short-term prevention. Now, this notion of prevention led us into the current day individual stress theories that we recognize that stress doesn't always produce crisis. And if we can intervene between the stress appearing and then the longer term hardships and strains and stresses that eventually lead to maladjustment and maladaptation and crisis, then we can prevent crises from happening. So let's move on. In the 1950s and into the early 1960s, we began to see a crisis management theory kind of take its take root. We've got Tyhurst that we talked about with the individual history of individual history of individual reactions to disaster. Um, in 1957, we had the Short Doyle Act, which established community mental health clinics. It was uh, federal funding for mental health clinics. And so we began establishing these mental health clinics, which by the way, in the 1980s and into the 1990s, we began to abolish. And that's why we have such a high homeless population. Many of the homeless are people that could have been treated in a community mental health clinic and, um, and kind of done much better, but because they didn't get treatment, they ended in crisis and ended up on the streets. Anyway, enough. Uh, the Community Mental Health Centers Act of 1963 was a continuation of that. Um, the suicide prevention movement, which began in the early 1960s, began envisioning 24 hour hotlines that were staffed by non-professional volunteers. And as you know, we still have that suicide prevention uh, uh, crisis line that you can call even until today. Then in 1960, as you remember, Sipneos and its components of an emotional crisis arose, which helped us understand how people go through individual crises. Next slide, please. The 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, we had some advances. Crisis journals such as Crisis Intervention appeared. Uh, there's a number of those crisis journals now, but that was one of the first. Cognitive approaches began to proliferate. That was the, the approach, you know, like cognitive behavioral therapy, or even prior to that, just cognitive therapy, where we recognized that people's way of perceiving stress, their thoughts about the stress, led to reactions to the stress. And so those approaches, starting with Ellis, and then Beck, Mike and Baum, and Lazarus, blossomed in the 70s and 80s. And we kind of took off with those. 1984, uh, you remember Hoff's crisis paradigm? Well, Hoff came up with that crisis paradigm and it helped us understand a little bit more. Crisis management at this point was thought to be more uh, economical, 
cheaper than long-term care. If we could intervene in the crisis, we could help prevent longer term, or we could intervene in the stressor, we could help prevent longer term crises. Part of that came out of the military. We realized that um, there was this thing called battle fatigue, now known as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But battle fatigue, if they could get to the soldier in the field and help them process through what was going on, then they wouldn't have the long-term crisis that would cause them to be removed from the battlefield completely. Next slide, please. 1990s and early 2000s, we see uh, crisis, formal crisis management develop further. There's several new models that developed, including the family distress model, which we covered in the last chapter, as well as the contextual model of family stress that helped us understand how families proceed through, from stress to crisis. Um, these were good met models that had implications for intervention, interventions such as we will see in the next chapter. These theories began to explore how culture impacts um, the, the perceptions and reactions to stress and how culture therefore can impact one's prevention of or drifting into crisis. Okay, in the next few slides, we're gonna explore very briefly, very quickly, some interdisciplinary contributions to formal crisis management theory and how it came about. So let's move on to the next slide. The first was preventative psychiatry. So preventative psychiatry focused primarily on several things. Kaplan in 1964 uh, envisioned a way of preventing crises from occurring, which is now known as primary prevention. So stopping the crisis from happening in the first place. Kaplan in 64 emphasized a community approach and working with a person's social network to help buffer the crisis. Lindemann, uh, as you remember, 1944, had that negative crisis outcome uh, method, that kind of secondary approach. Now the crisis has happened. What do we do then? Um, think about this for a moment. We can either react after the crisis happens or react before primary prevention to prevent the crisis from happening. So secondary prevention will be preventing it from getting worse. Hoff in 84 added the component of grief work, recognizing that a lot of what's going on with crisis is a sense of loss. And so he thought, why don't we take Kubler-Ross's ideas and apply them um, to, uh, to this? And that's out of that came that notion of ambiguous loss, right? Tyhurst in 57 helped us understand how individuals respond to disaster and how we can help those experiencing it. And then of course, Sipneos uh, came up with the components of an emotional crisis. So these were the preventative psychiatry contributions to formal crisis management. In the next slide, we'll turn a little bit to military psychology. I've already alluded to this somewhat. So let's move on. Military psychology helped us understand uh, the practice and importance of giving immediate help. This came out of the battlefield, right? If we could get to the soldiers after they've had you know, this horrible battlefield experience and help them through it quickly, then we can help them continue as soldiers continuing on the, the field of battle. If we don't, they will then move into crisis, post-traumatic stress disorder, and even you know uh, suicidal, even homicidal um, uh, kind of reactions um, or just kind of emotionally shutting down and therefore having to be removed from the battlefield. So that was the practice of giving immediate help. Immediate help prevents the crisis from occurring. So that was military psych psychiatry's uh, contribution. So next, we're gonna turn to psychoanalytic approaches. Remember, psychoanalytic was Freudian. Um, so let's move on. So the psychoanalytic approach assumes that people are very complex, uh, you know, that there's a lot of complexity to the individual. Uh, but individuals are also capable, in addition to being complex, of self-discovery, finding out who they are and what makes them tick, and that people can change. Out of this idea came the notion of empowerment. If people are capable of change and capable of self-discovery, then we can help them 
by empowering them. We can do with rather than doing for. Often it's said in uh, social work, don't do for a client what that client can do for themselves. So that notion came out of psychoanalysis. It allowed clients to be the expert of their own world, their own situation, their own experiences, their own plans, their own lives. And so because of the expert, they know best what to do, but sometimes need a little help to figure that out. Several other concepts inform formal crisis management that came out of psychoanalytic approaches. And that is psychic energy, that individuals have a certain amount of energy inside. And when they're experiencing really difficult times, like stressed out, traumatic times, um, their energy then begins to wane. Um, and so they have less energy to deal with stress. The notion of disequilibrium or unbalance came out of psychoanalysis that um, when unba unbalance occurs or when a, a family or individuals moved off of equilibrium, then their coping skills um, are inefficient, are insufficient and inefficient, and their energy is depleted, and so they are now unbalanced. Another notion that, that came from uh, Anna Freud, which was uh, Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna Freud began to talk about ego strength which is something that we all have inside our, as you remember, we have a uh, id, which is our basic drives. So we have a super ego, which is our conscience. And the ego is the, the self-awareness, the part of us that knows who we are and what we're all about. And that part moderates between the needs of the id and the strictures of the super ego. And so ego strength is when a person is strong, when their sense of self is strong. And that's a personal resource upon which we can draw to help people in crisis. Now, that ego strength, like psychic energy, may be a bit depleted during times of crisis. And then, then a, a worker, like a social worker, can step in and help reestablish the person's uh, ego strength and psychic energy and return them to normal functioning. Remember Freud did that whole thing, but sitting people on a couch and, and kind of free association and all that stuff. But Freud was a great listener. And so out of uh, psychoanalysis comes this notion of the importance of listening. Sometimes just listening to a person talk about what they're going through, just telling the story of their stress and their crisis can be healing. After Katrina, I went to uh, many hotels and shelters and listened to people tell their story. Um, and sometimes people would like talk to me for hours, total strangers, because they desperately needed to talk through the trauma. So sometimes just listening can be healing. And then finally, the notion of catharsis. So Freud came out of this notion, came up with this notion of catharsis that at some point in the talk therapy, a person begins to emotionally blow off or get out their feelings, right? They're, they begin to erupt and the stuff that's been held inside for a long time begins to come out. And this is the, what we know today commonly as getting it out, right? Expressing one's feelings. Freud called that catharsis. So that also came out of psycho, the psychoanalytic approach. Now let's next move to the existential approach and look at what existential thinkers had to teach us. So the existential approach is really all about the meaning of our existence. Why are we here on this planet? What are we here for? Why do we matter? Um, the existentialists were, um, were kind of uh, a school of psychiatry, school of psychology, but also a school of literature. So you've got like Jean-Paul Sartre was an existentialist and Camus was an existentialist. And all of them thought um, that we kind of look at life with either a sense that there is meaning or a sense that there isn't meaning. Life is, you know, everything's meaningless. And so we're just kind of going through life, doing what we have to do to get by. But if we believe that life has meaning, that our existence has meaning, that we're here for a reason, then we have something to work towards. So in the existential approach, they suggest that anxiety is a normal part of life, that everybody experiences anxiety. That anxiety is not something that is horrible and problematic. In fact, it can assist or aid our development. When uh, great performers 
go on stage, they experience performance anxiety that propels them to even better performances. Luciano Pavarotti, the great uh, Italian tenor, once said, if I cease to feel performance anxiety before going on stage, then I need to retire because it's that performance anxiety that motivated him to do better. Well, anxiety can be a motivating factor in our life if harnessed well. It can motivate a person to do something to moderate or relieve themselves of their anxiety. Now, we as social workers can use this idea to help clients redefine their situation as opportunities. Remember that the, the, uh, there's a, a school of thought that says change is a combination of two things, crisis plus opportunity. So when a person is in crisis or when they're significantly stressed out, crisis coupled with opportunity for change leads to long-term change, right? So if we can help our clients recognize their situation as an opportunity, an opportunity for growth, if we can encourage them to take responsibility instead of being just victims of circumstance, victims of their situation, victims of their stress, victims of their crisis, we can then empower them with choices that can benefit them for the long term, well beyond what we're doing. If we couple that with that notion of empowerment, we can empower our clients to take action on their own behalf to change their situation, change their world, and improve their outlook for the long term. We need, therefore, to help clients understand their part in the crisis and then help them think through their choices that, you know, ways they can do thing different, things differently, choices they can make to help them recover from the crisis and move on in the long term. Okay, next we're going to move to Carl Rogers and his kind of humanistic approach. So humanism, also known as a, a kind of a client-centered approach, recognized um, maybe for one of the first times in psychology that people are not necessarily problems that are just walking around, but rather that people are um, essentially good and people essentially want good out of their lives and good for the world. So Rogers purport, purported that people if they experience acceptance and something he called unconditional positive regard, loving them, looking for the good in them, even when everything seems lost, if we can give them that kind of acceptance and unconditional positive regard, people can grow. When accepted, people can better accept themselves and trust themselves and therefore make better choices. Out of this came the notion of empathy which is not feeling sorry for, but feeling with someone, kind of entering their world and feeling what they feel and feeling their pain with them. That that empathy, when used to help clients reflect on their life, knowing that they're supported in love, can help them express their emotions. And once freed of the negative emotion or kind of having worked through some of those negative emotions, they can then move on to positive crisis outcomes. So that was a contribution of humanism. Let's next turn to the cognitive behavioral approach. So cognitive behavioral approach suggests that something happens, an activating event, and then a person responds to that with some behavior or a thought or an emotion. So that is known as a C or consequence. So the activating event leads to a consequence, right? However, most people feel powerless because they feel that their thoughts and emotions and subsequent behaviors are because of the stressor, because of the trauma, because of what's going on outside of them. Therefore, they feel they have little control. Cognitive behavioral therapy says between the activating event and the physical, emotional, cognitive, behavioral consequence, there is a mediating factor, our personal thoughts and beliefs. Now, those lenses or beliefs through which we view the world cause us to see the activating event either as a problem or as a crisis or as a, an opportunity. So if we can change the way we think, we no longer have to think 
and feel and and behave problematically in response to the activating event, but rather we can change the way we think about the activating event. So how do you do that? Well, first you have to define the problem. What is the activating event? What is the stressor? What is the trauma that this client's facing? Then you spend some time with your client thinking about ways in the past that they've responded to similar activating events, similar stressors or, or problems, or hardships, right? Now then, the third thing you do is decide what the client wants. I want that to go away. Well, that's not gonna happen, so what else do you want? Well, I want to feel peaceful, I want to be relaxed, I don't wanna be anxious about it all the time. Okay, so let's talk about that desired outcome, how we can reach that. The fourth thing you do in CBT is you kind of brainstorm. You think outrageously and just list everything you can think of that might help you get from where you are to where you've now defined you want to be. And sometimes those solutions are just wacky, crazy, but you write all of them down, everything you can think of. And then you begin going through them after they're all written down and you kind of choose the ones that might work. Now remember, a more outrageous solution, something that's just off the wall crazy, could lead to another idea that's not so crazy. This is what happens in advertising. In advertising, they have a product and they want to uh, have the general public know a lot about that product. And so they'll just sit in front of a whiteboard in a room full of people and throw out crazy ideas, just nutso stuff. And some of those things are like, oh, wow, I never thought of that before. And that leads to another thought, leads to another thought. And pretty soon you get this kind of really cool marketing campaign that comes out of it. But it only comes from being very, very creative and just kind of thinking outrageously for a time. So you brainstorm alternative solutions, alternative possible interventions, things that the client can do to help them get to where they want to be. And then you begin to select number five, alternatives. You pick the ones that seem like they could really work. And then you commit with the client or the client commits to you that they will try this out. And so you then follow through with them over time to see how they're doing with the solution that they came up with. The final stage is that you don't just leave them with a solution, but then you go back and follow up and you make sure that the client is doing, doing the plan. We'll talk in the next chapter about the crisis plan. So these are kind of the cognitive behavioral steps to cognitive behavioral therapy, but they also apply to formal crisis management. In other words, CBT really helped crisis management understand that individuals and families have mental constructs through which they're filtering these things that are happening to them. And if we can change those filters, we can then help them better define the stress and help them work through it. It also helped us understand this concept of reframing that you've got this picture and the family has it in a certain frame, but you want to take it out of that frame using the same picture. I mean, it's still the same stressor, but put it in a different frame. For example, oh my God, this is catastrophic. It's horrible. It's awful. We'll never get through this. And then you take that frame and you reframe it as, wait a second, this is a, a terrible tragedy, but it's also an opportunity for you to do something different, to redefine your life, to try something new, to move in a new direction. So reframing <coughs> takes the client's original picture and puts it in a new frame from crisis and catastrophe to opportunity for change. If we can redefine such maladaptive behaviors using new definitions, we can help clients redefine the stressor that they're facing and redefining it can help them see it in new ways, presenting solutions that weren't so obvious before. The last approach that I want to talk about is the family systems approach, which is near and dear to my heart as a social worker and should be to yours as well. So let's move on to that contribution. So the family systems approach, as we've already talked about, or we'll talk about more. No, we've already talked about this in a previous chapter. Remember, um, Monica McGoldrick suggests that families go through certain transitions. So the young uh, the, the older adolescent leaves home. Now the adolescent's a single unattached young adult. 
that person meets somebody else and they develop a life partnership. Now they're a, a marriage or at least a long-term relationship, right? Something that will endure the test of time. They're committed to staying together. Then the next transition, children enter the scene, whether by adoption or fictive kinship or birth, children enter the picture. So now you move from a, a long-term relationship to a long-term relationship with the children. Then the children reach adolescence. So now you've got this adolescent child, which is a whole different set of stressors, and the parents now have to launch that child. Once that child is launched, the parents and all the children are launched, the parents kind of enter a stage of older life, but the children are now independent, and then they're single, unattached young adults, and the cycle starts over again. So one of the key contributions of family uh, the family systems approach is this family life cycle concept and how life is kind of a big circle. Now, there's a couple other schools that we need to think about. The structural family therapy thinkers really started with uh, Salvador Mnuchin. It gives us the idea of healthy families, families that are balanced and working together well, and unhealthy families are families that are unbalanced and that aren't working well. This is the concept of family structures or family patterns or family ways of, of coping that we saw in the last chapter uh, kind of placed on top of the two models. A systems-based family resilience approach gave us the notion that, that we need to focus upon strength. There was a great pediatrician once named T. Barry Brazelton. Brazelton would train young pediatricians by having them go out into the community to meet with their, their patients in their homes. He was particularly fond of sending them to homes in the projects of housing developments. And so these young medical students would go out and they would observe the family and they'd come back and report to Brazelton. They'd say, oh my gosh, there's urine in the halls and you gotta walk up several flights of steps and there's people hanging outside that seem threatening and there's gunshots at night and the mom is working two jobs and hardly has time for the kids and the kids are letting themselves in and there's not enough food in the house and the projects are not well taken care of. And Bradleton would say, hmm, well then how did this mother do such a good job getting where she's at? How are these children doing so well in school? How are these people even alive, given all, the things you, given all the things you've talked about? I want you to go back and look at the family again and think about how are they surviving and even thriving in the face of all these things you just said. Now, what Brazelton was doing here was a strengths-based approach. He was sending his young medical students back to ask the question, what is it that builds in resiliency? What is it that builds in strength? What are these families doing to cope with their situation that to you seems so impossible, young medical student. Well, this was the focus on strength. And so strengths-based perspective or a resiliency perspective has really begun to dominate social work and family systems thinking. Finally, when we do family interventions, we really build upon the resources and coping skills that a family already has. We help the family think about how their system is organized, what are their rules, what are their roles, right? What are their rituals? What are the things that they're doing to thrive and survive thus far? And then helping them build on those things to continue them and improve them into the future. So this approach provided a focus on both the individual, but also the family. See, it's one thing to intervene with an individual, but then they go back to a context, to a family. If we can help the whole family change the way they approach trauma and stress, then this family can cope better as a whole. Remember, the whole, the gestalt, is greater than the sum of its individual parts. So just because there's five members of the family doesn't mean there's five individuals, but when those five come together to form a family, something even bigger happens. So this was the contribution of family systems to uh, formal crisis management. Now, I know this has been a fairly short lecture, and that's okay because um, the next lecture will be longer because we're going to talk a lot about interventions. And so 
I want to give you a, a kind of a break this week. The next module will be two weeks long. And so because it's a little bit shorter, maybe it's time to get serious about doing some research for your paper and getting that paper turned in. Uh, you've got a little bit of extra time, so get to it. So turn from this point to taking the lecture on this quiz. Go through the other pieces in the module and do the lectures on uh, do the um, the quizzes on those, right? Then do the discussion board. Do some work on on your paper. I've also uh, included underneath the the paper section, which is after module 11. I've included a PowerPoint about how to access the library's resources and use those for your paper. Um, so that should be helpful. And I've also given you some resources such as APA style, the SUNO Writing Center, and how to contact the library if you need help. I strongly encourage you to write a first draft and then kind of work on that draft a bit and then have somebody proofread it before you turn it into me. Uh, that would be really, really helpful to you. Okay, my friends, peace be with you. I'll see you on the flip side. Take care, y'all.